like and subscribe to the 13 Mitigator Ford Fusion. I like well, thank you for listening to Let's Talk Racing TV. Let's Talk Racing. I'm Teddy Peter, driver of the number 17 Toyota in NASCAR Camp World Truck Series. And you're listening to Let's Talk Racing. <laughs>
the late models, the odd cars, is, this is just my first year. So when I came down from Wisconsin, I had never drove a late model stock. Oh, okay. So what do you think about it so far? Uh, it's a little bit different than the super late models back at home, but I think I'm getting used to it. What, what's the difference between the super late models up there and the late models here? You know, obviously the power. I mean, to transition from having a lot of power to going down and having a little power is different, you know. And it's just a driving style. you got to drive the late model stacks a little bit different than the supers. Yeah, I imagine you got to work on really getting the car to roll through the center with lower horsepower. Yeah, these late model stacks are all about momentum, whereas those super late models, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So how have you done so far? How many races have you run this year so far? We ran four races so far, and I guess just trying to move forward. Uh, I I would say the best race I had was probably my first race at Lane Race. Uh, we struggled a little bit at Hickory this past time there, but we're just trying to move forward and progress and look better each race. So when will you be coming back to Langley? Langley, actually this weekend I race at Langley. There's 264. Oh, okay. Cool. I'll have to come over and see you because uh, you see those Wing Champ carts that run before you guys? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll run one of those things, so maybe afterwards I'll come over and say hi. Yeah, definitely. And if you want to pick him out, he'll be the one in the back when they're all racing. <laughs> and he'll be nice. the <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell me about it being upside down? Too? I'm not going to go that no. far, but I'm, you, yeah, you flip one of them things over, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Paige, how old are you now? I am 21. Okay. Um, I ask this question of all young drivers who are coming up through the ranks. Have you set any sort of a schedule or a timetable? Do you say, I want to be here by this age, there by the next age, or do you just take it as it comes along? I'm trying to be really good at just taking it as it comes along, but you see young Chase Elliott out there winning nationwide races, so I think the faster I can progress and I have very high expectations for myself, the better. Well, but you've got to understand that people like Chase Elliott had a head start on you <laughs> because of his name. Right. I mean, whether, he's, whether he was going to be any good or not, he was going to get a, a better opportunity than you're going to get. Just because somebody would say, "Hey, that's Bill's kid. Let's give him a ride." Now, right. If he were, if he were just wallowing around and running in the back, then he 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 would not have any better chance than you do. But when you get hooked up with a an organization like Hendrick and Jr., then then you know if you don't screw it up terribly, you'll move ahead. So uh, I wouldn't compare myself to him if I were you, because he started with a, a bigger opportunity than you did. Right. Mm -hmm. Which means that in, in five years when you're running Sprint Cup and he's running Sprint Cup, all this will be forgotten. <laughs> That's the nice part, yeah. Well, I mean, you, at some point it will become a moot point that he's younger than you are. If you both get to the same level, it doesn't really matter when you get there. It's what you do when you get there. So, you know, he don't... I wouldn't look at him as the reason... as is, is a great cause for concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, let me ask you about Langley, and I've been around here a long time. Is, is Langley, and I've never driven a lap, so I couldn't tell you, is Langley Page as difficult as we've been hearing for the past 55 years? Is it as tough a place as, as they make out that it is? Uh, just to be honest, I would say that going to Hickory was tougher for me, and I struggled more than at Light Light. And that's just, that might just be my driving style, or that I have previous laps at Light Light, I don't know, but I would definitely say that Hickory gave me more of a hard time than Light Light. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, did you begin on dirt up in Wisconsin? I've never raced dirt. I raced full carts, and obviously they race in the rain, but that was... The only type of experience I had, nothing on dirt. Okay, I thought you were raced on dirt up there. No. Do you know the Kansas family very well or at all, being from Wisconsin? So I've raced against Ross Kenseth quite a few times. Oh, okay. And I will be racing against Matt Kenseth at the Slinger Nationals coming up here. Oh, okay. All right. Well, if you beat him, then that's automatically that gets you a, a cup ride. So you just, <laughs> you just got to beat one guy, you'll be okay. 
So how long did you run the? How long have you ran the super late model up in Wisconsin? I ran those for two full years. So last year was my second full year. Um, I did the Wisconsin Super Late last year, and then I ran the Super Late last year, and then I did the Wisconsin Super Late last year, and then I ran the Super Late last year, and then I did the Wisconsin Super Late last year, and then I ran the Super Late last year, and then I ran the Wisconsin Super Late last year, and then I ran the Super Late last year, and then I ran the Wisconsin Super Late last year, and then I ran the Super Late last year, and then I ran the Super Late last year, and then I that's, that's pretty good. Now, do you get a lot of grief for being a, a young woman and a man predominantly sport? Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> are you being funny or, or, did, or is, it, is it a lot? I think that, I mean, you're always going to get it. I, I try to just ignore it and just try and do my thing and drive the car as much as I can. And obviously being in the shop with all guys, you're going to get picked on a little bit more. But I think I've grown to have tough skin and learned, and I think I just don't want to bother me anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I imagine, you know, I know it's like for me and Jack, that uh, the most more we pick on each other, it's just really more we like each other. <laughs> all right. <laughs> he won't admit it, but he does. <laughs> so who is your crew chief with the, with Rev? Davin Fight. Oh, okay. I know him real well. Okay. Is that a good news, bad news thing? Well, that's a good thing. I mean, oh, okay. He's, he's Sometimes been... you say to these people, well, I know, no, 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 he's, he, he's cool. I like him. And uh, <laughs> how much help do you get from Coleman Presley? I know he's around there somewhere. Coleman is definitely around there somewhere. I've been trying to convince him to come help me in the late model. Now, he would be a good one to help you with a late model because, you know, he's he's got a lot of late model wins. Oh, I heard that. That's for sure. So are you going to are you going to look to doing any, do any of the big races here on the East Coast like Martinsville, um, Southern National, or Myrtle Beach, or something like that at the end of the year? No, the only like I said, the only races they have scheduled for us is just some of the local shows at Langley, Hickory, and then Motorboat. Okay. Yeah, that's that's about it. Yeah, that's the only ones that have. Hey, it's getting back to an earlier question about whether people maybe give you a hard time about being a woman um, and, and I'm, I'm trying to make this as honest as I can have you ever gone to, to anybody i.e. you ever gone to anybody like Danica have you ever gone to any other woman driver and said hey you've been there you've done this you know what it's like what should I expect or do you just field all the issues as they come along and, and uh, you know, don't don't ask anybody for any advice. Um, that's tough. I guess I'm always used to the one giving the advice because I have a younger sister and a younger cousin. So I try and be that tough one, and I try to be that person that they look up to. And I really believe that they do look up to me. However, down here, I also race with McKenna Bell. She is racing for Rev Racing, and. She really came with open arms and explained to me how she understood the struggles I was going to be going through and stuff. So I think as females gravitate toward each other to a certain point, but at the same time, female drivers are very strong-willed and hard-headed, that's for sure. <laughs> now, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'll agree with it, though. <laughs> well, there might be a whole lot of people who agree with it, but I ain't going to say it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Now, you're coming up here this weekend, is that correct? Yes. To Langley. Langley. Now, what's the program? What are they having? Twin 64s. Twin 64s. 64s? Why? Because <laughs> they're crazy. 64th anniversary, I guess. Uh, you know, I was yeah, thinking about be. that. I think it several, is. They got several Twin 64s out there. Well, the track's older than that. 64 years? Oh, yeah. Anyway. All right, you know um, Jefferson Hodges has a little bit of background at Langley. Yeah. And I'm sure if you ask him, he'd be glad to <laughs> tell you some of his war stories. Um, I've heard some stories. He helped out. He really helped me out at Hickory a couple weekends ago. He's always there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's always everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, where would you like to be in five years? Five I mean, years? I mean, you'd like to be in Cup, I'm sure. Yeah. But realistically, how long would it take you to get there? If every best case scenario. Uh, realistically, I would like to be there in five years. I mean, 
I'm hoping next year I can get my K9 car with rub racing and from there to go to Nationwide. So I think, I mean, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen with these diversity drivers, how they can move up to Nationwide. So I think the goal is very realistic when you see it happen with drivers that have been in the same program that I have been. And this is a diversity program and a developmental program under that NASCAR name. So NASCAR works very closely with us and they do all they can and give us all the resources that we need to move up to NASCAR. Well, they, they, I'm, NASCAR, believe me, I've been doing this a long time. NASCAR would love to see people like you and McKenna Bell and Ryan Gifford. They would absolutely love to see you people be successful and move up the ladder. Um, right now, it is perceived primarily as, as a, a white male sport, and, and they would love to have some diversity in the program. You just got to, you've got to earn your way, but they'd love to. I'm, I'm sure they'd love to see you come up. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Now my last question is this. Now Marcus Cadet has left NASCAR. He's no longer part of the D for D program. Do you have any idea who's going to fill his job? Have y'all got any idea who might be the next Marcus Cadet? I do not know. No. Okay. Wow. That's pretty. I didn't know he was gone. Yeah. yeah. But you will be back here in October for the Combine, most likely? Correct. Yep, I have to try out again at Combine in October. Okay. More good seafood. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's Alan's seafood. Can't forget yeah. that. Well, if you see it, you got to eat it. Well, we're going to get gonna get you up here. When you come up, we're going to try to get you to come over to the show, baby. Sounds good. Actually, my parents and sister will be here this weekend watching me at Langley, so I'm even more excited about that. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. All right, well, do you have any sponsors, anybody you want to thank, and then we'll let you get back to what you were doing. All right. I definitely want to thank NASCAR and Toyota and Rev Racing and the diversity program for the awesome opportunity that they've given me uh, to move down here from Wisconsin and compete in these late model stock races and have the advice and all the help that I'm receiving. It's remarkable, and I know this is life-changing. And I definitely wouldn't change anything for the world. So definitely thanking them for everything they've done for me this year. All right. You got that part down, Pat. Yes, you're good at that. <laughs> well, we appreciate your time tonight. And look, when you see Cameron, tell him I said thanks for all the help getting you on the show. I will definitely do that. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank right. you. Talk to you later. Okay, sounds good. It's been a while. Let's talk racing. How you doing? Is this Frank? That's me. How are you? Hey, Frank. This is Jack Dawson. We've got Al Pierce and Scott Allen and Roger Brim with you tonight. And first of all, congratulations on being a part of that big Indy 500 win. Thank you. That was a neat day and uh, working around last year. It's, um, you know, Indy 500, we threw, threw one away last year, so it was kind of a sweet redemption to get back there and uh, win one. Now, how is it when you're spotting at a place like Indy? I mean, can you? I mean, you can't see the whole track. So, how much help do you get as far as when you're spotting there? Oh, uh, well, Indy, we use two spotters, like uh, a little different than what the way the NASCAR guys do it. There's, there's a spotter stand overlooking turn one, and then there's a guy down at turn three. Um, and what he, you know, what he can see, I can't see. So it's a, a good even handoff, and we're not really talking over each other. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, you know, they're coming at you fast and you know, you're right on top of the racetrack, but it's a challenge for sure. Frank, from where you were standing Sunday week ago, could you tell that your guy had won by maybe half a car length or so? Were you able to tell from your view that, that you had won? I wasn't real sure. You know, you look down there and you see two yellow cars, you know, and that was sort of a little bit uh, tricky to the eye, but I thought it was close. It looked closer from my vantage point than... Well, it really was, but it was still a close finish. When, when did you actually realize that y'all had won? Uh, Ryan knew right away, you know, because he, he could look over. Oh, yeah. So he, he, uh, he, he yelled and screamed, so I was like, all right, we got this one. So, um, <laughs> and other than that, nobody, nobody really said much. We were uh, kind of in disbelief, I guess, you know, just uh, full force all unfold that way. Now, a year ago, y'all finished 
you, you last year, am I, am I correct? Last year, Ryan uh, dominated Indy but did not win. Um, did that kind of weigh heavily on his mind that, you know, last year should have been mine, let's get it this year? Or do you reset at zero each race you go to? Uh, you know, the Indy 500, you don't reset at that one. You, you don't get that many chances at uh, you know, that one. And, you know, we were leading on the last restart there uh, year before last. And oh, okay, year before last. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it was last year, yeah. So, um, yeah, we're setting up on the restart. And, uh, you know, you, you got a whole year to figure out, man, what could I have done different? And, um, you know, it's Indy 500. So, um, yeah, he, uh, he was definitely... Uh, you know, good protector, do whatever it took to win. And then the red flag there towards the end of the race, and, you know, kind of worry about the, the car not starting. And, you know, you don't see the, um, not typical, but that's something you see in any car series where they'll red flag a, a race. So everybody's a little worried this car car's not going to start back and that kind of stuff, you know. Well, if they had not red flagged, if they had run under caution, you might have had maybe one or two laps at the end. As it was, the fans pretty much got their money's worth, I think. It's, um, I know it was a controversial call, but it was probably the right call. I agree. I think that's, you know, fans pay to see the races, and, you know, that Indy 500, you lead up to that all month, and, uh, you know, a lot of guys go out there every single day at practice, and watch qualifying, and, uh, you know, they had the Grand Prix there uh, a couple weeks before, so a lot of build-up to that to that finish of that race, and you get robbed out of that. It's got to going to be bad for a fan or even a competitor, you know, you want to race for it, so um, I think it was the right call, I think everybody does to all the competitors, and um, I think you'll see more of that in the future, if it allows, uh, circumstances allow it to, to, you know, red flag it, let's race for it. How long have you been doing the uh, spotting for the Indy cars? Uh, the first one I went to was in 2003, I went with the uh, spot for Robbie Buell, and um, and been back ever since. Um, did a lot of NASCAR stuff as well, and sort of keep my schedule open where I can always do that Indy 500. But I'm, I'm out here in Texas now, and uh, got the truck race this weekend with Eric Jones, and um, and then we'll do the Brian on Saturday night here in uh, Texas as well. Well, so you got a pretty busy schedule now. When you uh, when you started spotting, did you get a lot of information from Mike Herman? I know he he has to be he has to be your mentor. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's going to claim anyway. <laughs> Mike's a good guy. We have a lot of fun and, uh, um, yeah, watch him race a lot. And, you know, he's a, he's a true racer. And, you know, we group of us hang out, hang out together that are, you know, pretty hardcore racers. And, uh, you know, if you're a racer, you're a racer. You can go race a street stock or a Indy car. To me, it's all the same, you know. Do you have an RC car to race with him yet? That's what I was going to say. No, I haven't. Uh, he wants to make me the Grand Marshal for one of his races over there at the RC track. I hadn't, uh, hadn't done that yet. So. A Grand Marshal for RC well, Yeah, yeah they got a Grand Marshal. They got an official score. Kelly's the official scorekeeper over there. They they got it going on over there. Mike's got it going on. <laughs> now, the Mill Hill Stadium. It's going to be big. I, I can tell. It's getting a big build up. Uh, now, tell me about this nickname Mike gave you. The the pen. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Huh. Oh, we're not going to get an answer on that, right? Yeah, I don't know. That's, they call me the kingpin, so they uh, <laughs> sort of to the pen, so we have fun with it, you know. Frank, let me ask you another question, and, and I want you to be brutally honest with me. When when the IndyCar community first heard that Kurt Busch was going to try to do the double, when the, when the whole organization first got the word that he's going to do it, Honestly, now, what was the initial reaction? Uh, I think they knew it was a good, good for the, the race, and, and you know, it was obviously boosted the TV ratings, and, and and got you know got a lot of uh, the spotlight was on from the NASCAR community. The ratings were off the charts, so um, I think they were didn't know what to think, but they all knew he's a racer, and you know, he you know came to race for the Andretti team, so uh, you know, I knew about what he tested, and I'm Kurt and I friends, so. Kind of kept up with the whole thing, and you know, after the banquet there on uh, Monday night, I mean, he had, you know, he gathered so much support from the whole, uh, the whole driver community there. They want him back, and you know, they they know he's a racer, and um, I don't know, it went over big. I think uh, I think he's hooked. It's going to take him a little bit of time to digest the 
all the travel and all the all the commitments that he had to rearrange to make it all work. But um, at the end of the day, I think he realized it was worth it. I mean, it was a huge sacrifice on his part that didn't get much sleep the whole month. But was there much concern among the other IndyCar drivers that this guy's flying back and forth? You know, you said he may not have a lot of sleep. He's that was his first open wheel start of any kind in his old career. Um, a little bit leery of, of a rookie like that, or did most people think, well, he's a rookie, but he's not really, he's a, a cup champion, which is something. We'll, we'll not be quite as careful around him as we might have been, or was there some concern that let's let him get 150, 100 laps in, and then we'll kind of race with him? Yeah, I think he, um, Kurt did a good job of, of talking to every, you know, all the other drivers and getting their opinion and, and you know, and talking to Montoya and all the, you know, all of his Andretti teammates and just trying to get a good feel for who he was getting himself into. So I think he got a, a, a good feel, a bit of respect outside the car before um, before he ever made any laps, just talking to everyone and, and, getting, and processing the knowledge and knowing what to expect. And then, you know, I think he had a good approach and, um, he worked up to it, and he you know, had a little mistake there on the uh, on the practice days, but he learned from it and uh, changed his race approach probably. And it, you know, it, that could have happened in the race if he had not, you know, happened in practice. So, I, you know, I didn't hear any, any negative or anyone, anyone scared to run with him or whatever. They, you know, you know, he's a racer, and it didn't take long for them to figure that out. Okay. Now, Frank, what is it like being on a spotter stand and when you win uh, Indy and everybody else around you just lost and you're probably on a high, and then how long does it take you to get to victory lane? Yeah, Indy's, um, you know, it's such a big deal that all your uh, peers that are really happy for you, it's, um, you know, they've seen you around for a while, but, you know, they, they, you would have meant to finally get that Indy 500 win, but... The, where you are at Indy, the, the spotter stands so far away. Most of the Victor Link stuff was done before I got down there. So <laughs> it was a, uh, you know, the sea of people. You know, three three hundred plus thousand people you got to wait through to get down there, and you know, everybody wants to beat the Victor Link. So it was still still fun. Did did Ryan want some drivers? I understand want a lot of feedback. Other drivers say, "Don't talk to me until you have to." Did he welcome your feedback, or did he want to kind of do it on his own? Yeah, he does. Um, last year, I worked with him the whole season, and they only take a, a little bit different than the NASCAR guys. They only take a spotter to the oval track. Some of the track, some of the teams do use spotters at some of the road courses, depending on personnel. But um, and any team, we only do oval races. So, um, so those guys to road race one week, and then finally get an oval mindset. It's a little different where. Um, the NASCAR guys are always in that oval mindset. So, um, you know, last year I built, you know, built a rapport with him, and I think uh, we, we had some success together and had some good runs, and I think he's, you know, a lot more comfortable this year rolling into the season, you know, after working with a guy for a whole year, you know. Yeah, but I guess what I'm looking for is, is he the kind of driver who wants you to tell him everything or only tell him what he has to know? Uh, well, you know, those cars are so much faster. You, you sort of keep the the uh, communication to a minimal. Um, you know, there's a lot going on there. They've got so much in-car adjustability with fuel mapping and all the things they're doing. They, you know, the car uh, car adjustment, weight jacker adjustment. So they've got a lot going on. So, so typically, you talk left anyway. Um, and, and they're going so fast, you just don't want to. You can't. These NASCAR guys, you know, they keep the mic. They talk all the way to the corner. You've got a full dialogue, a lot of conversation, but. In any part of the transitions are pretty, pretty short and sweet. And, um, in some of the races, some of the short tracks, I think I'm able to give them more input because they're, you know, some of the races are more line sensitive and that kind of thing. But um, indeed, there's not much you can do. You don't really have, you don't have quite the vantage point. You can help with some, but um, you don't uh, have the vantage point that you do with these rest of the rest of the track. So, he, 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 and Helio, Helio traded the lead. I think three times in the last two laps, or. They went back and forth. Is that the kind of time when you just shut up and let him do his thing, or do you say to him, he's outside, he's inside, or, or you figure at that moment he knows what he wants to do? Yeah, he pretty much knows, but you know, you sort of watch it back for him a little bit, try to help him anticipate if someone's getting a runoff. Um, you know, uh, because those cars will do a run pretty fast, so you, you know, 
and, and make a last minute move and like a kamikaze type move. So, and that, that kind of thing is where you tell them. And you know, a couple things earlier in the race, um, we got got the battle of Montoya pretty heavy earlier in the race, and just kind of reminding us long race and be smart with newer racing and, and that kind of stuff. But um, you know, some of the short tracks you do uh, you can help a little more with lines and you know, where you move around in the Indies. You know, you don't really search around line wise, but yeah, you are just kind of watching his back and, um, you know, helping him clear last, make last second uh, clears where he can make the move he needs and, and just in line to get in the corner if he's just passing some water. Um, you know, the track so narrow that is there in India, it's, you know, staying out of the debris and things happen fast in front of you, so you, you've got to be on your toes for sure. Yeah, my, my last question is this if Castro Neves had maybe started his last move a little bit earlier, Maybe a second or two, or two or three hundred yards further back, uh, would it have been different, or did you think your guy had it all the way? I think he was going to have to earn it. That's for sure. I mean, he was, Ryan was going to do an objective chance to block him or whatever. I would say, but uh, um, you know, I think he made the move at the right time. I think um, you know, I think it's you know the way he came off, the way Helio came off turn two, just set him up to try to make that move. Um, you know where he did make the move, so I mean I don't really think he could have made it any sooner, just just the way the cars race. But but um, it was definitely cat and mouse. And if he made it too early, if he got the lead too early, he was going to get set duck. So yeah, um, that's kind of kind of catch twenty two there for sure. So when they were coming out of turn four. What was going through your mind? Yeah, I didn't know. You know, the, the, where we where our vantage point is uh, in turn one. It's the cars are coming straight at you, so. You don't know that they're so far away. You don't really know if he's got a better run than, than Ryan or anything. So, like, well, you just hope that he didn't get a better run off the corner and you know be able to duck out last second at the line and have a foot or two on him. But I mean, you know, in two yellow cars, it's sort of hard to really hard to delineate which which one's going going where. So, you know, I didn't know if uh, didn't know if he's gonna have enough power to pull it off or not. Cool. Did okay. All right. Well, we appreciate you calling in tonight, Ben. <laughs> you ain't say nothing. Well, Dad, thanks for having me. And, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I appreciate you calling in tonight, Ben. Oh, Ben. Okay. <laughs> Be nice now. Yeah, I was. I was just talking with Kelly earlier about, and he told me to call you Ben. Who's that? Kelly. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Well, we appreciate your time, and we'll, and we'll hopefully get you back after another win later on. Sounds good. Thanks, Carl. All right, man. Talk to you later. <laughs> you to say hello to Humpy. You just hung up on him. Go back on the speaker. Come on. And when you when you go from here to here, he's automatically live. Oh. Well, we should have had the monkey over there doing it. That's why I just hang up whatever line and then whatever's left, that's going to be... Hey, because all you got to do is when you're done with the other one, punch the other line and it's automatically there. Well, you don't have to worry about hanging up and not hanging. And... Now we got to wait, wait for Humpy mm -hmm. to figure out that you hung up on it. Uh, oh, well. Actually. There he is. Yeah, there he comes. Well, you might as well answer it and say, oops. We're sorry about that, Mr. Wheeler. I had a little technical difficulty. One of one of the monkeys couldn't handle. Uh, okay. Oh, I think one of the monkeys couldn't handle the the thing there. The one talking to you, that is. That's yeah, that's me. How you doing tonight, Mr. Wheeler? Doing fine. Doing fine. All right. Well, you got Al Pierce and Jack Dotson and Scott Allen and Roger Brim with you tonight. And what we want to do is get with you and 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 you tell us a little bit about the things that you've been into in racing. Oh, wait a minute, that proof you've got, have you, has that been approved by the FCC yet? <laughs> uh, well, well, I don't think they by FCC. <laughs> hey, Humpy, how you doing? Hey, Al, how you doing, man? I'm, I'm doing great. Listen. Uh, you're not over the bench. Yeah. Uh, listen, I appreciate all the time you gave me at Charlotte a couple of weeks ago. That was very kind of you. Yeah. And I, I did not realize you were heading for graduation that weekend. Yes, I was. Yeah. I, I, I had, I had to double up on graduation. You had a big time, didn't you? And, and I had to go listen to, to Jeff Burton give the commencement address at Canon Academy. 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Let's see what else he well, he's a, he's a Duke guy, so it probably was fairly intelligent conversation. Tell us about Speedway Benefits, Humpy. Well, Speedway Benefits, Storm Kid, is, uh, you know, despite the empty seats that we see at a lot of tracks uh, across the country uh, that NASCAR and IndyCar is involved with, the short tracks, particularly the dirt ones, uh, we're seeing a lot of full houses. And uh, so Speedway Benefits, we started it basically to try to uh, uh, grab some attention for the short tracks and to help them out. Basically, we sell uh, advertising for them. And we all buy them because uh, everybody buy every short track, you know, bought the same thing, uh, leading off uh, with toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the paper company and say, we want to buy 300,000 rolls instead of 300. And all of a sudden, the price drops to right after <laughs> I think the thing that's helped us out a lot is the economy is still not well despite what's coming out of Washington from both parties and um, the, uh, the the short tracks across the country which have uh, had a tendency not to band together have been actually done this. We've got 350 of them right now, including most of the uh, really good ones. Uh, we got this... Uh, Sawyers from down your neck of the uh, woods, Al, and we got uh, uh, Alley Commander up in Lebanon Valley and uh, uh, Skagit Speedway out in uh, Washington, and those those are top-notch tracks. They compromise the huge sector. So we 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 really got a good uh, a good group of them, and I'm enjoying it because you know that's been my first love. I started off in the racing business, uh, uh, actually racing on short tracks. And then found out that really was not the way I should be going in racing. And uh, I switched over to promoting and uh, did a little bit, a lot better promoting than I did racing. <laughs> so I enjoy, I'm enjoying being back and seeing these little half mile and quarter mile and three eighths mile, both dirt and asphalt tracks uh, operate. But now you're doing the great race this year. You're coming up in this month or in July? I am. I uh, know it's, it's coming up in two weeks. Okay. I got through, put some brakes on the front of my uh, uh, Hudson Hornet, 53 Hudson Hornet, coupe, and this afternoon, and it's just about ready to go. We start off in Maine, and we go all the way down to uh, Orlando, and we do this in about seven days. And as you know, it's a rally. Um, uh, and it's very, very complicated. It's not an easy deal to do because you got to go from point A to point B in a certain amount of time. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. And there's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar worth of prize money yet. So uh, a lot of and as Buddy Baker said, he and I used to travel all the time. He Sixty. He says, "I'm just glad you got a navigator because you'd probably end up in California." <laughs> <laughs> he with, "Come on." Now your grandson's gonna be your your guide dog, right? Yeah, and he's a, an absolute math genius, and I've got him studying the maps like uh, he's, uh, you know, an Einstein on the maps. So the first time that we went out in the Carroll West Point, uh, we went on a, a trial run, and he beat me by two minutes first time. So that shows you uh, <laughs> it's probably going to be a big help. <laughs> yeah. Now, Humpy, let me ask you, and I don't want to dominate the conversation, but you and I go back a long way, and I want to ask you a couple of questions similar to what I asked you in Charlotte the other night. We talked a great deal about what NASCAR needs to kind of get back to the golden age, although nobody really seems to know when that golden age was. You used a term that I wrote in Auto Week that might piss some people off. You said we need more villains and fewer pretty boys. And, and I presume you stand by that. Explain to our audience, in your mind, what is a villain and why can't pretty boys also be important? Well, my very good friend, uh, Richmond, California, 
run the Pixar, kind of like many cars. Uh, when he first started in the uh, animated motion picture business, he worked for Walt Disney. And Walt said, Walt said the first thing he said, John, he says, make sure that when you have a cartoon, that it within 60 seconds you have it eat. And if you don't, every kid in the United States is going to turn to another channel or they're going to get totally bored. And I don't care whether you're wrestling, boxing, playing football, have a billet. And, you know, we used to have billets. I mean, you know, people, a lot of people today, they, they, they think Leonardo was a beloved character and all that kind of stuff. And as you know, he's a very good friend of mine. But to half the people, he was a villain. And uh, this is what's between today. We don't have that harsh rivalry. I mean, for gosh sake, look at all the whacking around it. And they really don't have a villain. And they have emerged as a villain. Every time Kirk Bush just comes Pluto in Popeye, uh, he smiles and pats somebody on the back and then it goes away. Uh, so we're missing the villain. And part of that is also comes from a lack of contact while you're in the league. You know, the rich Bobby Allison, and Bobby Allison, and David Pearson, and Gail Yarber, and Daryl Walter, of rivalries really came from guys when they were contesting for the league. And they were rubbing fenders and trading paint. And uh, the people just went crazy when that went on. Now, uh, you know, people thought, well, Daryl's a villain or Kale's a villain or whatever. But it didn't make, didn't make any difference. There was a villain involved. And we just don't have that. Day. You know, I always thought that one of the great tragedies of racing was that, and it wasn't a tragedy, but I mean, it, 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 uh, uh, it certainly took steam out of it. I always thought that Dale and Jeff Gordon would end up in this horrendous rivalry. And one day, I thought, Dale calls me, he says, I'm going to business with Jeff. Just bought a piece of land next to the speedway. He went into business with him for God's sake. What, what are you talking about? Well, you know, we did. I thought, oh my God, the apocalypse is upon us. Ticket sales are going to fall right out of the sky. They're in business with each other, and now they hit each other over the head with ball team hammer, but they did. But Humpy, will will sponsors let you be a villain these days? Ah, you hit the word on the head. Sponsors. <laughs> we have too many, uh, and I say this in absolute seriousness, uh, because the sport is uh, different sponsor on most cars every week. You know who the cars are. Uh, you don't know who that 17 is going to have on one week to the next or the 20 car or the well, 20 car, not so bad. Uh, but we, we've just got too many sponsors that are, uh, because the cost is so high, you got to have those. And so they change colors and even the announcers can't figure out where the drivers are. So I think that's a big problem and I think that's something that uh, uh, if I were running NASCAR, I would eliminate right off the bat. I'll say, guys, for one thing, I said, uh, you know, you uh, you got to keep the same color year long, year long. And uh, the other thing is, don't let the sponsors take this sport over as a flat half. I'm telling you that. But when you were running the speedway, I, I remember distinctly well. I've been doing this long enough to know that Charlotte had any number of different sponsors year to year based on who's coming in and who's going out so it, it, you know it's kind of difficult for one sponsor to carry your team all year if it just doesn't have the resources no it isn't and that's why we need to get, continue to work on getting the cost of these cars now it's totally ridiculous it costs 10 million dollars a year to uh, run a race team it should cost five Bobby Allison and I and, and Larry McReynolds had lunch yesterday and we were talking about this. We're talking about Bobby Allison's great 67 Chevelle. And uh, we had all looked at it in the museum and that car was so simple, so easy, it was unbelievable and it was a great race car because it took on the might of Chevrolet. I mean, not Chevrolet, but uh, Chrysler and Ford and, and these in a lot of places. 
got to get back to that. It's just entirely too expensive. What a shock. It costs $5,000. And that shock that took Bill Elliott around Talladega at 212 miles an hour still exists. And it was $85 in, and it's gone down in price to 65 today. Why shouldn't we, we be running that shop? It's just totally asinine that we have gotten the cost as high as it, as it, as it has, and we need to cut that out. And, and you think speeds are too high also? Speeds are much, much too high on intermediate tracks, as you well know, you've been in business a long time now. When you're in Charlotte and you're hitting over 200 miles an hour down the front straightaway, I'm telling you, I don't know anybody that can race in the corners. They can't. It's just tennis. And uh, it also contributes horribly to the arrow push problem, which happens again on the intermediate tracks when the lid takes a off and it's gone, like what happened in the All Star race. Then uh, Jerry, uh, Jamie McMurray hit the throttle. He was long gone and nobody could catch him. It took all the drama out of the all-star race. And uh, to a certain extent, Jimmy Johnson did the same thing the following week at, uh, at, at Charlotte, as he did last year. It, so uh, those are things that uh, we got to work on. And NASCAR is working on, despite their, they, 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 they haven't said anything, uh, except I know they're working on slowing the cars down. And the greatest thing can happen, because I think that's what they get back to passing for the lead. I think that's one of the big things people come to racing to see, is passing for the lead. Uh, not just one pass after a pit stop, but what happens, the guy passes the leader, he's in the lead now because he's in clean air. But the fans won't see is that car that just got passed, passing again. And to a certain extent, that's what got us here. Uh, with Bobby Allison passing Richard Petty, David Pearson passing Bobby Allison, all those kind of things back and forth. Daryl Walter passing Kelly Yarborough, et cetera. We need to get back to that. And uh, it's just take some work, but I think slowing the cars now, and NASCAR's got a great. Uh, a great idea for that, uh, I think will help tremendously. Humphrey, there was a time when you probably were not nearly as impressed by the NASCAR hierarchy as you are now. Fair to say? Oh yeah, because uh, when Billy Prince was running NASCAR, we used to have arguments all the time and debates. Uh, I watched Brian come up and uh, he does understand the problem he's got around his neck, but it is the stone that he's got around his neck is a stone that is loaded with sponsors. And the weight of the sponsors, you got to have them in one sense. And at the same time, maybe you don't have to have as many. Now, that's crazy. Let me tell you one of the craziest ideas I ever heard. And this came from a guy that really knew what he was talking about. And I won't even tell you who he is because he, they stumped him. Do away with sponsors for cars. Illegal to have a sponsor for a cup car. Now, I'd say that and all of a sudden, wait a minute, how could anybody afford to have a race? Well, he did that. What would happen? Well, sponsors still want to be involved in the NFL. So they pour the money into the teams, into the stadiums, into TV, and ratchet the hours up on that side so much. Then the NFL comes around and says, oh, uh, this is how you pay the players. And so the players end up paying a lot so much. And that's what would happen. I started having these sponsors on the cars. The money would the the the, uh, the sponsorships like don't run from like the first race right pretty well yes not from say uh hundred thousand dollars from Austin uh the six hundred uh the the sponsorship money so so, $5 million offer, 
you're going to have to pay the driver's tenant. And so everybody that wins a race in cup racing wins at least a million dollars. So the place maybe gets six hundred thousand. Everybody starts a race and get at least one hundred fifty thousand dollars stuck them out. What would that do? It would take all the behavior problems off the drivers because then the driver is not having to say, I got to placate my sponsor. I have this, I don't have a contract anymore that says I can't cut, I can't call, call Gus, I can't do anything that uh, is going to take away from, uh, uh, from, from that sponsor. And uh, so it will be like, back like it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even in the 90s, where drivers could say pretty much what they wanted to, and if they wanted to throw a punch, they'd throw a punch. And um, uh, they wanted to rub fenders in the car and spin a guy out, they'd do it and pay the uh, price later on. But right now, we've corporatized the drivers too much. Uh, we've turned them into button down collared racers. Pretty boys. Uh, pretty boys. <laughs> I said the other day, the biggest problem we got is, you know, what we need is, is is we need something to come along right now and, and uh, challenge Jimmy Johnson as the superstar. And he's a wonderful guy, etc. And the biggest problem with Jimmy Johnson State is he had no rivalries. Um, what we need is some cats down in, uh, oh, he's, he's, he's in the sagebrush in Texas right now. He's running some old track down outside of El Paso. And uh, he's just driving these guts out. And he's winning races. He is a head race driver. But he doesn't look right. He doesn't talk right. He doesn't act right. He's tough. And he's got a girlfriend, but nobody sees him. He's a shoot, shoot, probably shoot a thousand yards in the fly. All this kind of thing. No sponsor wants to touch him because he doesn't look right. He doesn't act like he's dressed right. If I talked about Dan Earnhardt when he first started in the cup race in the course, if I talked about Junior Johnson who just got out of federal prison on the Daytona 500, yes I am. Um, those guys today would never get a ride. And Lord, look what they've done to the, what they what they meant to the sport. Humphrey, you may you probably realize this, but it's a stunning figure. Harry Gant did not get his first full-time cup ride until he was 40. That that would never happen today no matter oh, no. how good the driver was. He would have uh, never had a ride. I mean, he was 25 really before he started uh, yeah. racing uh, formally. And uh, he just uh, he came along at the right time. But even today, Harry would have a tough time because uh, there were a lot of things missing from Harry that maybe some sponsors were, but at the same time, what a folk hero he was. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, uh, he, he uh, never, never, ever forgets for Harry Gant's story. Now Lee and I sit down, and we're in the trailer, in the school trailer at Daytona, and Harry's sitting there, not in a word, and you know, but I have that kind of thing. Harry just not the same thing, and with him, and uh, so, uh, Al and I have this argument about this driver. It's one particular driver, I won't mention, who just wouldn't get He just wouldn't get And we came up with all kinds of philosophical ideas about why he wouldn't get We got down for about 45 minutes. Harry hadn't said a word. I turned around and I said, Harry, what do you think about it? Harry said, he scratched his head. There ain't no problem, man. He's just scared. <laughs> <laughs> he nailed it, because that's exactly what's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and sooner or later, he got my way. But uh, that's, that's how Harry was. And uh, we need another Harry Gann on the circuit. We need a... Uh, we need a... Like that. Uh, a lot of fat get down and dirty, let's go, get out of my way, Kale Yarbrough type driving style. And um, so to corporate tales, now one of the things that's interesting is the fact that uh, 
this this still can happen because you know I remember before in heart time, Jim Goodrich had this huge huge problem with counterfeit parts, and they were fights, and uh, they they had this commercial. And they had Earnhardt in it. You remember that? Yeah. He's running around the restaurant. He's running around Martinsville. Martinsville, yeah. The restaurant. And because that's what happened at Martinsville. He just did that. And what they were trying to do is they were saying, this is the real thing. This is the real guy. And that's what you body shop operators need to do. You need to buy our parts for these less parts that come from other places. And so they use Earnhardt to, uh, to a great degree. So maybe we'll have more sponsors come along that will do things like that, and uh, uh, maybe bring some of these uh, uh, cats from, uh, like I say, Texas or the wilds of uh, uh, Idaho, Montana, cowboys that, uh, that, that that can flat drive a race car. But right now, a classic example, I'm up at Indy two years ago, and I, I talked with my good friend, A.J. Foyt, I said, if you were 19 years old again, Day, what would you do? Said, well, I would, you know, I'd be down there racing some track in East Texas. I wouldn't be in Indianapolis. I couldn't afford to get up here. And I thought that was a terrible tragedy because look what that man did over the years. Look at the tickets he sold. Look at how much controversy he created. And a lot of sponsors had a problem with AJ Boy. And today they would really have a lot of problems. Yeah. Puffy, my last my last question is this: Are the Bush brothers as close to villains as we've got now? But they're not close. They're not close enough. Okay. Uh, they're just uh, you know every time Dirk gets mad and somebody gets mad at him and whacks him out, the great life peacemakers come along. And I don't know what they, what, what they do, they pat him on the head, they take it and give him a massage, they do whatever they do, and all of a sudden, the next time we see him, he's all calmed down. Funny thing they did to Tony Stewart, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah. Tony, Tony was well on his way to being a, a, a super belt, but then he went through the great washer of NASCAR. And I'm not talking about NASCAR as the organization, but now start town. And it was 5,000 people to make up the circuit that we travel to here and there. All right. Well, Mr. Wheel, we appreciate your time tonight, and hopefully we can get you back on, because I want to go into some of your background the next time we get you on. We need to just plan a whole one-hour show around yeah. it. <laughs> well, we'd love to do that, and uh, thank you guys for having me on. I enjoyed it very much. All right, well, we're going to be in touch with you and try to get you back, and maybe we do a whole hour with you. All right, that'd be wonderful. Hey, Humphrey, one thing. The, the, great, the, the, the American great ride you're on, does it come through Virginia, or does it go west of here? Actually, it comes down into uh, 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 it comes down into uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and then we go stop in Norfolk. Oh, okay. Uh, so we'll be in Norfolk, Virginia, right there in your backyard. Yeah, right across the river. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we look forward to seeing you. Maybe you come by there. I will. There'll be a lot of people on there. I'm making a point to come by and see you. Thank you, Humpy. Appreciate your time. You don't ever need to make an appointment. Oh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Humphrey, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's hit line two. Let's talk racing. How you doing, Jeremy? I'm doing good. How about you guys? We're doing good. This is Jack Dawson. got Al Pierce and uh, Scott Allen and Roger Brim here tonight. And how's things down your way? Uh, really good. Everything's cool. If you can hear my dogs barking, that's... Sorry about that, but everybody's going good. Everybody's real good. Well, good. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was this. You're, you're, you're starting out doing some more, doing a different type of racing now. From what I understand, you're going to be doing some modified. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we've uh, we've been uh, running the uh, Cole Modified series, and uh, it's pretty neat because I, you know, I never really in the past ever thought about running modified. I always, you know, kind of stuck with the stock cars and things like fitters on, but. This thing is really fun to drive and uh, I have a great time doing it and uh, it's fun working on and, and really I, I don't know why I didn't in the past you know, think about that because they're really cool cars and uh, like I said, I have a lot of fun driving them. 
So is that is that your car, or are you driving for somebody else, or what's what's the? No, it's uh, it belongs to the couple guys that uh, helped me out with uh, everything we got going on with the, the J2 uh, brand and all that stuff, and uh, uh, they own the car. Uh, so I'm on it. I'm just uh, got the luxury of driving it, and, and just appreciate all their help and everything they're doing for me. And uh, you know, we got a lot of great stuff going on that they've helped me with, and. Um, you know, and a lot of good things that's going to happen for us in the future, and, and uh, this race is part of it, you know, so that's a good thing about it, and, you know, we're going to do some dirt racing also later on in the year, and then we've got a couple cars getting ready to get ready, and, and uh, just got a lot of good things going on in the future for us. Well, tell us about the J2 thing that you're you're involved with and, and your program that you got going on. Tell us a little bit about that and, and how it all comes into play. Well, it's kind of, kind of wild, you know, different things happen in your life, and different people come in and out of your life that you're not sure how it all happened at the time, but, uh, you know, I, I look at it as God sent, <laughs> pretty much, because, uh, you know, I had a, a and now it's become a good friend, but a, a guy named Ted Board and, and another guy, his friend, was Aaron Thomas, and, and they come in, uh, right towards the end of this thing, and, I uh, say about a year ago, we got to know them pretty good, and, uh, they just reached out and wanted to help, you know, and it seemed that we were, you know, struggling, and, and a lot of things happened to us, and, and we first just started off being friends, you know, and just went out down a few times, and the next thing you know, it's, uh, you know, that they're, uh, they're just getting behind me 100% and, and felt like that they wanted to help and do the best they could and they've done a great job with that. And, and along the way, it became, uh, you know, just kept, it keeps evolving, getting bigger and bigger. And, and then we you know, started the brand J2 and it's uh, the very second time around pretty much is what it stands for and, uh, you know, the second chance. So they've, uh, I can't thank them enough for what they've done to come in our lives, Shane and I, and with their families and, and want to help like this. It's pretty cool. Now you released that video, the, the the one of the part one of the series that you're doing. Tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how you come about doing that. Well, you know, it, it was kind of uh, simple. You know, we threw out everything that happened to us um, over the last five years. We never really got a chance to, to explain our side of the story about anything. You know, we just kind of got that got shuffled to the back. But every time I did an interview, it never you know never came out or bits and pieces of it did, and, and just really never got a chance to tell our side of the story of what we went through, Shane and I, and, uh, you know, as we got to uh, uh, know uh, Ted and, and Aaron a lot more, you know, a lot better, and become friends, that they realized that, wait a minute, this needs to get out there, because we're not even, if you watch the news and you've seen, you've seen everything that's put on the news about me, that's so untrue and so not even close to who I am, and, and they've seen that, and, uh, and they're like, man, we got to get this out there, just at least before... Uh, not before, but we just want to get your side of the story out, you know, so that people and, and fans out there can see it, you know, and see what the real genre is, you know. And I never really realized it like that until we stopped and started thinking about it, and, and I, I thought to myself, man, if I, I've seen stuff on the news, I'm kidding you, it'd blow me away, too, if I was outside looking in and didn't know the truth. So, you know, that's all they're trying to do. We, we've just uh, done these videos, and they're not trying to bash anybody, just trying to, uh, you know, for the fans and people out there that don't know, and that would like to know, you know, that's our side of the story. We're telling it straight from the heart. It's just exactly like we've seen it the way it happened. So, um, when will the next one come out? And what what when, what are the plans for it? Yeah, it's kind of pretty soon. You know, we just uh, like I said, we're just a small group here that uh, uh, trying to race and trying to do a lot of things and, and trying to put uh, you know our videos together. And, and, and they've done an amazing job doing that. And they're going to keep getting better and better. And, uh, but the next part two is coming out, I'd say, in the next week or so, a couple weeks maybe. I'm sure exactly, but uh, it's going to answer a lot more questions that, that people have that have asked us about the first one. You know, and uh, a lot of factual stuff uh, from expert people and doctors and everything else is going to be on this one. So we're, gonna, we're just going to keep doing that until, until it's all done. And, and you know, like there again, I'm not trying to you know, call me in trouble or anything else, but I've got to clear my name. I've got to let people out there know. Uh, from our side of the story, what happened, and, and that's only fair, you know. And um, you know, so hopefully that people understand what what Shane and I have gone through, and, and what we made it through. We're still standing, and, and hopefully it'll inspire somebody out there that, that maybe you know having a bad time or going through struggles. Maybe it'll help them understand that that you know you can still stand up and you can still hold your head high and and move on with life, and that's what we're trying to do. I guess the the thing that a lot of people are are looking at and, and, and I really don't know the whole I mean I, I, I'm like a lot of people I guess I've seen the stories and everything that goes on with it why one of the questions is why why did you wait five years to, to come out with it well I really don't know I mean I, 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 I,
really didn't wait five years. I mean, it, it's just taking this long because I didn't, I didn't get out of all my legal battles until uh, January this year, and that's when we started on this thing. Was was about then, and and that, that's all that was. Was you know, I, the whole time that all this stuff's gone on, my attorneys give me advice. Oh, don't say this, don't say that, don't talk to the media, don't you know, don't do this. And, it, and all I've done is been setting up. You know, I've been sitting here just getting hammered by everybody their opinions of, of what I who I am and say the other. So it, it seems like it's taken five years, but it hasn't really it's taken five years to get it over with. So now I can tell it. And, and that's all it is. It wasn't. It wasn't like I was just waiting in this time frame. But although it was good timing, because I did have a group that, like I said, Ted and them that got behind me that made all this happen or helped make it all happen, and, and it's just kind of a timing issue for anything. With with the thing with NASCAR, I mean, what are you? Will you ever think about going back to NASCAR? And will you? I mean, what is the circumstances now with that? Well, it's kind of like this, you know, it, a lot of people, and our next video is going to explain a lot of that, but, you know, you got to go through this road of recovery, you know, and and the best way for me to, to describe it is, is I didn't do anything wrong. I took Adderall, I took Claire to D, and I explained that to everybody and told the world that day one. I wasn't trying to hide anything, I had a prescription for it, and all my testament reports, everything goes along with it. And I just have a hard time believing, and then it, this is just who I am, what I believe in. It's just, you know, just the way I am might not be the way everybody else did, but, you know, I had to stand for something, and, and I couldn't just, I wasn't going to, you know, go through this road recovery thing with taking Adderall. It was something that, that was legal, that, that it was prescription. It wasn't like I was doing anything wrong. And, and I just have a hard time with, with going through this road recovery. It just sounds bad. It sounds, you know, just rehabbing all this stuff, and it just did not make sense to me. It still doesn't. But, on the other hand, if, if there was an opportunity of any, any, decent car out there, if I had thought I had a chance to drive a car, and they said, Jeremy, you got to go through road recovery, do whatever you got to do, man, I'll be the first one to do it. I'll, I'll be all over that to, to go to be able to go back and drive. But for me, this is to go to road to, to Dr. Black's road to recovery, which doesn't have a very good success rate, especially up until my deal happened. There was no need of me, me fighting with him in his battles. I mean, the guy, first of all, I, I would never, ever pee on a cup for him again because there's been two false positives that, that you know, he's claimed it's been part of the test, and, and I'm for sure don't want to be under that type of uh, situation again with him. I, you know, I of course one thing, but Dr. Black does another thing, and I just don't trust it, you know, and, and but if there's an opportunity out there, I'll do everything I could to, to be able to, to get back in the car, but if there's not, I'm not going to let him control my life in any way, shape, or form. So he, if that, that, he's, the, he's the lead candidate in, in the uh, road to recovery, right? Yeah, well, he, he's the guy. Who, who actually designed this uh, drug policy for NASCAR, and he's also the guy who did it for WWE when, when you know, they had problems over there with with uh, wrestlers dying of steroids, and, but yet they were showing up negative on, for steroids on their test. So, and he's the same guy that did that, and, and he's sitting there, he's the one that designed this policy, he's the one that owns the lab, that, you know, that, that where the, you know, the test go, go to and get tested, and he's the one who owns the, re the road recovery system. So you go out his way and you come back in his way, one man. And it's just things to me like that's a conflict of interest because there's no way of contesting anything that he does. If he says you're positive on a test, you say, well, send my B sample to another lab, but let me check it. It doesn't happen that way. He, he's, his way is the only way. It's the right way he thinks in his mind, and that's not right. And that, that's the problem I had with it. You know, it's one way in, one way out for him. And it just doesn't seem right how you can own the lab, own the policy, own the, own the recovery to get back in through one man. It doesn't make sense. And I don't think it makes a lot of sense to anybody if you really sit down and look at it and thought about it. Have you, in, in the time the time frame that you've been out, and of course I knew you said you had to get your, your, your legal stuff taken care of, have you had any, any discussions with NASCAR or trying to... to to try to get that, you know, get to a point where maybe you could come to some kind of an agreement on that or, and do something, or has that been just out of the question? And that, yeah, no, they, they haven't, I haven't spoken to really them about even sitting down trying to even think about working any of this out. That they don't, they obviously, obviously don't care, you know, they, they didn't care day one, they just went in and just boom, come on, they got money, they didn't even want to hear my explanation, never even talked to me about why I was even taking that off. So, I mean, nothing's ever been said. It was just cut and dry. Boom, you're suspended. That's what John Darby called me that Saturday morning and said, and it was over. And the next time I spent was in court, and then 
you know, delay, no way everyone to sit down and, and try to work this out. And the bad thing about it is, it could have all never happened and been prevented if all he had to say was, Jeremy, we don't want you taking that at all. Don't ever take it again. And we're going to test you every week to make sure you're not taking it. If you are, you're suspended. That would have been a hell of a lot better situation than what's happened now. You know, now, now it's just got blown out of portion, and, and, and I can't I can't fight billionaires. You know what I mean? There's no way possible I can right. do that. So, you know, the money wins, and that's the way it went, and, and uh, that's part of life. You know, and I've learned from it, and I'm trying to move on now and, and get myself back together or financially and, and get racing again and, and go on, you know. That's what the whole point of this day two uh, campaign is kind of about. It's, you know, we want to start over. I'm standing tall and standing proud and, and going to move on with life, you know. Well, I wish you the best. I hope every, you know. I hope it works out for you. Gets everything you, you get everything you want out of it. And one of the things I wanted to ask you also is, what do you, what do you, what would you say to the NASCAR fans that have kind of written you off and said, "All right, you did it, and we're not, and you know, we're not going, we're not going to, we're not going to pull for him, or we're not going to deal with him." Well, then, I mean, I hate to basically feel that way. You know, I think that if. If and when that they see our side and hear our side of the story, they might have a different opinion of that. And, you know, this isn't just about my fans either. This is about NASCAR and Gerald's fans, too. You know I mean? They're, they didn't help them anything. Everything that happened here didn't help them much either. You know what I mean? So if the whole situation was bad, I wish it never happened. Uh, you know, and I'm, I apologize for anything that, that I've created through all this because I wish now I'm... I was just, I've been better off just quitting and I ain't going to race anymore, you know, go back and get my late model stuff or something, but, um, you know, I just, uh, it's what happened, and, and I think that everybody that listens to my, my side of the story will have a different opinion on that, and if they don't, I'm sorry, you know, that they, they feel that way, you know, everybody has opinions, and, and we'll just move on, you know? You know, one of the things, you, 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 were, you were a hell of a driver when you were coming along, and one of the things that I remember the most about you I think it was at Pocono when you moved Dale Earnhardt out of the way to get that win at Pocono. I, you know, I was a big fan from that point. Right, I appreciate that. You know, and that's one of my highlights of my career. You know, it's, it's, that race was just awesome race, and, and the sport has changed dramatically since the loss of Dale Earnhardt. And I think everybody's seen that. The, the grandstands are seeing it. NASCAR's seeing it, and that guy was awesome. And and, and that's something they can't take away from me. Is, is, my ability to drive a race car, you know, and, and that's something that, that's never changed. And I love racing with guys like that, and, and it just, you know, a lot of great memories with the sport, and I still love the sport. I still love NASCAR stock car racing, you know, I love it more than anything, you know. I hate the situation happened, but uh, that, like you said, that's up there that nobody can ever take away from me, and that's, uh, you know, the race with Dale Earnhardt, Darrell Walter, Kelly Arbor, all those guys. With the, the, the time frame that you've been out of the sport, in the five years, let's say, just for the general say, saying that you can go back and drive, uh, the, drive the car down, do you think with all the changes that NASCAR has made in the cars and in in all the stuff that they've done, that you could go back and, and, and get back in there and, and do, the, do the job like you did before? I think I'm probably a better driver now than I've ever been. You know, I feel like now I've gotten to sit back and look at it and I've watched a lot of stuff going and I've just run a lot of stuff in my head throughout past five years and you know I'm, I'm racing this modified now not that it's competitive as the, as the NASCAR series is but uh caught on to that real quick and uh you know, we had a great car last weekend at Coastal Plains and pretty much was going to dominate the race and led the most laps and everything else and we were real close to winning that race so I think it won't be all the way back to victory lane and I think it's a matter of if you're a race car driver you're, you're always one you know it's not like I forgot how to do it or I don't understand it because I've, I've really worked hard in the last five years on keeping up with everything and what's going on. And, and you know, a lot of the drivers that still run their front are still the same ones. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I've been there for a long time and they understand it. And, and there's a difference between driving the cars and understanding how to race that sport and, and, and NASCAR racing. And it's 500 mile races and you see these guys that try to do everything they can not realize you just got to lock some laps for a while and then, and then be there at the end. And a lot of them forget that. And, and I can at least, uh, Finish better than, than a lot of better even right now, you know. So where will you be racing the rest of the year? I mean, what, where, what places will the, will that series be going? Uh, we're racing at uh, actually uh, Ace Speedway uh, next weekend, not this weekend, but next. And we go back to Hickory, and uh, from now on, there's several more races. That, that It's pretty much a, a 10 or 11 race series throughout the year, but what we're trying to do is, uh, what we're going to do is, we've got two uh, third lane models that we put together, and we're going to race... Uh, 
pretty much uh, two or three times a week. I got a crate late model car, a 525, and a, a super late model that we're going to be putting together later on in the year that we'll be able to run like, you know, six, eight races a week. You know, and that's what I'm going to be really focusing on and trying to get a, get my hands around that and get a good handle on, on the dirt racing program and, and just try to, you know, travel the country and, and, and race as much as we can and see as many people as we can. And, and then, you know, hopefully, uh, if we do that, there will be a lot of people that see that, that I'm not uh, what I was perceived to be, and hopefully they'll have a different uh, outlook on what we got going on. Well, Jeremy, I appreciate you taking time out to call and, and, and talk to us, or we call and talk to you, whatever. We appreciate your time. I hope everything works out good, and hopefully when you when you get out there and win some of them races in the dirt car and in the modified, we'll get you back on here and we'll talk about that instead of everything else. Okay, like I know, and, and I appreciate you having me on. Like you said, I, I'm a lot better when we're talking about the future instead of the past, and, and uh, hopefully that'll be coming up real soon because we, we're real confident we're going to be... Uh, win some races here pretty quick and then we'll uh, have some fun to start talking about. Well Jeremy, tell Ted I appreciate him working with me to get you on the show. Really enjoy, I really enjoy talking with him too. No problem buddy. Anytime you just let us know and we'll be more happy to. Alright man, we'll talk to you later. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Alright now. <laughs> Interesting, he said if he had a ride, he'd go through the program. You won't get a ride until you go through the program. So it's, it's almost like a cash twenty two there. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he would do it differently now. You know that that this turned out. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what he thought he was going to accomplish. But you're not going to win. Almondinger went through it and came out. Others have gone through it and came out. <coughs> <coughs> and, and I can tell you, and I can tell you from a personal yeah, experience, yeah. you know, uh, mm -hmm. I see things a little different than, than what he said, but I respect what he says. I mean, you know, that's his theory, but um, I, I, I seen it from a personal standpoint, yeah. mm -hmm. and you know, and I, you know, that, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to bring that up. But, and it worked out for your family. It worked out great right. for us, and I mean, you know, and that's I, that's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna yeah. let it go. Well, with you're that. right. You're right. I'm gonna let it go with that. But, I'm, but my know, point is, if there's a ride waiting for him, then he'll do it. But you know, that's not going to happen. Oh, no, but it's easy to then, well, I should have jumped in, I didn't want to, to say, well, <laughs> you know, if you, if you, you yeah. if you'll agree to do it on your terms, then why won't you do it on their terms? You know, no, anyway. Bye, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready for crab cakes. <laughs> Shutting up. Oh, by the way, did you stop any good eating places when you were doing the charity ride? No, in fact, we didn't. Yeah. Most of the meals were part of the deal, so we ate what they brought us. That sort of. No in and out burgers, no Five Guys. Nah, I didn't in and out one time in, in California. You should have told Kyle Pitt, wait a minute now, man, come on. Get, get with the program, get some good food here. <laughs> Well, we went to five guys. That's good. Well, tell us tell, who all was involved in the ride. I mean, some, I mean, other, you know, some some names. Well, people. Richard, Kyle, Herschel Walker, Harry Gant did the whole thing. Bodine did the whole thing. Uh, Donnie Alsen did a few legs. Rutledge Wood was there for a couple of days. You him be long good, right? He's okay. He's okay. He's, <laughs> he's got absolutely no talent, but he's. <laughs> Well, tell us how you really feel. But he's no, he's I mean he's got he will tell you for a guy who doesn't have any marketable skills, I've done pretty well. He'll tell you that. <laughs> he got that right. Yeah. <laughs> they love him. Yeah, he's a nut. It is what it is. Yeah. Y'all yeah. yeah. ready to wrap up? Yes, sir. I know Al's ready for them crab cakes. He's been salivating over there, been watching <laughs> it. I was thinking I, I looked at the clock and when it said eight. I was waiting for him to get up. <laughs> I was too. I was like, well, I'll come here and get up. And we got Jeremy Mayfield coming on. The fact, the fact, had, the fact that you had good guests was well, enough to keep uh, you. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you hey guys, much. I'm Daytona 500 winner Trevor Bain, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Races. Hi, I'm Robert Richardson Jr., driver of the number 23 Dodge Challenger for R3 Motorsports in the NASCAR Nationwide Series, and you're watching Let's Talk Racing. I'm Teddy Peter, driver the number 17 Toyota in the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series, and you're listening to Let's Talk Racing. Here's your 2011 champion, David Perron. Hi, this is David.
David Palenz, driver of the 33 NASCAR Late Model, 2011 Old Dominion Speedway Track Champion. Thank you for watching Let's Talk Racing TV. Hi, I'm Sam Hunt, driving the 42 car. I want to thank Let's Talk Racing. Hi, my name is Natalie Sather. I drive the 94 K&N Lady Eagle Safety Wear Butler Built Seats Bell House.